Okay, our last item of the morning, um, I would I would tell you, is our most important item of the morning, and that is an update from on our mosquito control program. Dr. Chris Hunter, who is the director of our health services, is, has joined us to make a presentation. Um, let me mention a couple of things um, before Mr. Hunter, or Dr. Hunter, begins. Um, we're very concerned about making sure that our citizens are. Um, getting the information that they need to have about how to protect themselves and how to protect our community um, from any spread of Zika here. We have not had a local case. Um, we're very, very pleased with that, but there are a lot of things that citizens can do, small, easy things that they can do, and we need everybody doing them. Um, so in that, to that end, I'm going to ask each of the commissioners, um, as you walk away from this, to to uh, look at every way that you can through your contacts, through your neighborhood associations that you represent to really get that message out and um, any creative ideas you have to encourage people to understand that, that they really have a lot more control than they probably think they have. Secondly, um, tomorrow we're going to um, host the same presentation. Dr. Hunter is going to give this presentation to our hospital tomorrow, right? Yeah. To our hospitality um, industry. Um, we are going to then give uh, the same presentation to our municipalities, um, Orange County Public Schools, um, our university systems, uh, and then we're, from there we're going to have a tri-county meeting. So we're looking at um, making sure that we are personally contacting um, industry leaders that we think have a significant role to play in this. Um, and we're going to be putting something out through our neighborhood association contacts that we have. So um, we just don't want to leave any um, container <laughs> um, unturned. Is that, would that be kind of the correct um, yeah. um, yes, analogy in this regard? So we appreciate the support of, of everyone here. And if you wish to attend uh, the event tomorrow, we certainly welcome you there. It'll be very similar. We thought it would be great to start here with the presentation. So with that, we are extremely pleased to be joined today by Dr. Hunter and also um, by Kelly Deutsch, who is the uh, interim manager of Mosquito Control. And I think everybody's had an opportunity to meet um, Ms. Deutsch. If you haven't, I'm pretty sure you have seen her if you're watching any of our local news. Um, she's become quite the, the um, star because she has had so many appearances. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank and recognize the media that's here today and our local media that has covered this subject extremely, extremely um, responsibly and, um, and diligently because without them we would have no chance of getting the word out. With that, Dr. Hunter, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so yeah, I'm here to talk about Zika preparedness. Um, so I'm going to, to go into a little bit of detail about the Zika virus and the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. We've talked about this uh, a little bit before, but go um, uh, somewhat more in depth and, and hopefully try to dispel maybe some misinformation you may have heard and, and maybe, again, just reiterate some of the things that we do know about this illness and about the mosquitoes that transmit it. And then I'm going to go into more detail about how we've been responding locally within Orange County to these uh, travel associated Zika cases and suspected Zika cases that, that we have seen here in Florida and in Orange County. And then I'm going to discuss the plan moving forward if we were to have local transmission like they've had in Miami Dade. And, and that way you guys will understand what our process is going to be uh, should that unfortunately happen. So you know, the, the Zika virus is a, it's what's called a flavivirus. And I mentioned that for a couple of reasons. One is that it, it's actually related very much to other arboviruses that we're more familiar with, dengue and chikungunya, which we've talked about here in the past. And the symptoms actually mimic that. They're, they're pretty close in nature. The, the good news about it being a flavivirus is that those viruses in general are not very difficult to test for from a laboratory standpoint. There's a couple different ways through PCR and ELISAs and other tests that you can do. So now that we've come forward a little bit more in our understanding of Zika, we have been able to, um, when I say we, the scientific community, has been able to come forward and create tests uh, that are much more available. Uh, than they had been in the past. Even our commercial labs can now run tests for Zika. So that happened very quickly, and it's because of the type of virus it is. Transmission of this virus occurs mostly, mostly through the bite of an infected mosquito, and that's the most important you know, aspect of transmission that we focus largely on. Also, maternal fetal transmission occurs, and that's where some of those more devastating side effects can happen that we'll go into a little more detail about. It can be transmitted through sex. 
It is not considered a sexually transmitted disease just yet because this is not the primary cause of its transmission, but we do know that it can be transmitted through unprotected sex. It could also be transmitted through blood transfusion or organ transplant or, or a laboratory exposure of a certain type. There are no documented issues with that, but I know if you've been following the news, a lot of our blood banks have come out and saying, hey, we're testing our blood before you do this because, of course, that is a, a real threat for someone who donated who is infected. So now I know locally one blood is testing for, for Zika now uh, with, our, with our blood donation. <clears throat> So Zika virus was, is not new, as we mentioned before. It was actually uh, isolated in 1947 from rhesus monkeys in the Zika forest of Uganda, which is where the virus gets its name. Uh, in 1952, it was first discovered in a human being, again, uh, in Uganda. And over the next 50 years, it spread throughout sub-Saharan Africa, largely um, without much attention being paid to it, because again, this is a virus where the majority of people had no symptoms at all, and those who did had very mild symptoms in comparison to the already existing very difficult and, and sometimes deadly uh, mosquito-borne illnesses in that same area, dengue and chikungunya, malaria. Uh, in 2007, there was an outbreak in French Micronesia in the island of Yap. And at that point, they found on these small islands that up to 70% of the population had been infected. Uh, and there was some interest because of how, how broadly it had been spread. In 2014, it unfortunately occurred for the first time in the Western Hemisphere, uh, first in Chile and then much more broadly in Brazil. And in 2015 is when we really all started paying much more attention to this virus when the first reports of a link to microcephaly came out. And as we know now, in 2016, we have for the first time had local transmission of Zika within the continental United States, uh, just a few hours south of here. So the, the map underneath there shows now where we have active transmission technically of this disease. The clinical presentation of Zika is usually quite mild. Uh, conjunctivitis, some body aches, maybe a mild fever, some arthralgias, that's, that's really just aches and pains. The vast majority of people infected with Zika don't have any symptoms at all, which is good for the infected person, but makes it very difficult from the standpoint of an epidemiologist to try to track the disease. You can imagine when you don't know that you have it, it's very difficult for our folks from the Department of Health to find out who's been infected and who hasn't, and that's where it becomes very difficult for us. Uh, it was linked to microcephaly in 2015. Some research done right here locally from Florida State University actually showed some of the cellular basis for how this virus does do damage uh, to the neurons in, in the fetus, unfortunately. It's also been linked to fetal demise in something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a, a, a kind of a nondescript uh, neurologic deficit that can occur in response to a specific number of specific viruses. Uh, and if it's not treated properly, that can also be fatal. But that's very rare. The, the real <coughs> big true concern here is for microcephaly. Uh, and again, microcephaly just describes the size of a baby's head when it is, when it is born. Uh, babies whose heads do not develop to the normal size typically have some pretty devastating neurologic outcomes, uh, which can be lifelong and unfortunately also lead to fetal demise. So this is a, a very serious thing when it comes to uh, you know, maternal, maternal fetal transmission. Uh, those people who are infected, if they do have symptoms, it usually occurs within two or 12 days of the bite, uh, and it resolves in seven to 10 days. Um, one of the biggest issues with Zika, I mentioned before, not a lot of attention was paid to it from the scientific community because it wasn't seen as a large threat, uh, and, and you have to kind of go where the threats are. That's where grant money really comes to um, until recently. So now we're pouring money into research and we're finding more out. But some of the answers to great questions that we receive from the media and from the public are, you know, how long are you infective? How long does it last? We don't really have great solid answers to that just yet, but they're now starting to look into it. It's believed that the virus lives in your bloodstream for somewhere between one and three weeks, which would suggest that for about two to three weeks after you've been infected, you could infect a mosquito if it bit you. Uh, it, it is believed to, to be able to be transmitted sexually for longer than that, maybe even up to two months. So that's where the CDC advice is coming down, where it looks a little scattered, where it says, you know, it's, it could be several weeks or it could be several months. Um, particularly when it comes to sexual intercourse. So it's important to recognize that this is a moving target still as we learn more about it. I mentioned earlier the testing. We can now do blood or urine tests to require for confirmation. Uh, that makes it a lot easier for the public health folks. There's no treatment or vaccine available, although we've been told from the federal government level that there are several private groups that are being funded to develop a vaccine. Uh, vaccines take a long time to develop. So we are still a long way off from that being the answer to Zika right now. So until that happens, the main source of protection is to limit exposure, and that really comes down to limiting exposure to being bit by an infected mosquito. 
Unfortunately for us, here in Central Florida, we are in a climate where Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes can breed year-round. If you look at the map uh, over here of both Americas, you'll see the red areas are the areas where there's year-round mosquito activity. Up in these other areas that are yellow, uh, usually anywhere above about 6,500 feet is considered mountainous. They do not really, uh, they don't breed there. Uh, obviously, we do not have mountainous areas here in Central Florida, so we fall right into that red area where we do have this type of mosquito breeding year-round. Uh, over here, you can see the distribution of those types of mosquitoes that we see again in Southeast America. Florida is very much obviously right in the center of it. And as such, unfortunately, over the last year, we have seen, of course, folks coming here from these infected areas, these areas where there is distribution of mosquitoes that have tested positive for the Zika virus. Uh, in the state of Florida, as of August 15th, we've had 413 confirmed travel-related infections of Zika. That doesn't include Zika infections in pregnant women. For some reason that I don't understand, they separate that out. So this 57 in pregnant women actually should be in addition to that, which would really make us at 470. As of August 15th, we also have 28 non-travel-related infections, and we're going to talk about that a little more in detail uh, about what's happening down south. So just a few weeks ago, as I'm sure you're well aware, we had our first incidence of local transmission of Zika, again, in Miami-Dade County in a one-square-mile area. Uh, they have been focusing very largely on the, the Wynwood neighborhood, not just the Department of Health, but the Center for Disease Control. There were four original cases, and then over the next few days, they, they've added several more cases. And the reason why that happened wasn't because likely of active spread of, of infected people with symptoms, but because as the Department of Health followed that tree while they said, okay, you have, the, you have the illness, who are you contacted with, where do you work, where do you go? They started testing everyone else's contacts. And that by doing that, they were able to detect a lot of people who did not have symptoms, but did have, have the, the illness. So that's where those numbers have increased. Uh, unfortunately, as of yesterday, we also had the first case that, that we know of, of someone who contracted the illness in the Wynwood area who has left Florida. There is a case in uh, Texas, in the El Paso area, of someone who is positive for Zika who had traveled to this area, and it is believed that they, that they transmitted it or that they contracted the illness while they were there. So what was done, uh, you know, the governor w was, was here, made a comment. They have brought in kind of strike teams from the Department of Health. They also brought in a CDC uh, emergency team, which has come in there and actively helping them with epidemiology. Miami-Dade Mosquito Control has been focusing, obviously, very intently on that area. The CDC gave their first ever warning within the continental U.S. for pregnant females or those hoping to come pregnant not to visit that one square mile area. And I want to reiterate, this is a very small area, right? There's a very just small section, and there's a lot of resources being pulled into it. So these are the culprits. This is Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes, and we've talked about them in the past. These are not new to us. These are the insects that we have been focusing on because they spread other diseases for many years now here in Central Florida. But there are some concerns and some issues with them. One is that they are well adapted to urban environments. We talk about this. They like living with people. They primarily feed on people. They like to live near us. They're daytime biters more frequently than, than in the evenings, and that is something that comes up a lot. Most of us think of going out in the evening and at night and getting bit by mosquitoes. These mosquitoes primarily feed during the day, uh, and they're, they're difficult to control. And, and the reason why is, is this, their breeding habitats. I mentioned they're very distinctly uh, you know, good at living in urban environments. They seek out standing water in containers, and primarily those containers in this day and age are man-made containers. Uh, I, I think it was, a, it was a Commissioner Boyd, someone mentioned tires, we see tires down there, little containers, bags, anywhere where small amounts of standing water can gather. Uh, again, th this is where they breed and they want to be near us and it's normally near our homes. This makes it very difficult for us. The other thing that makes them difficult to control is that they can grow from eggs to mature biting adults in a very short time span in the summer months like right now. It can only take about a week before they lay their eggs and they can start biting. So, so we know that these mosquitoes are near and around people. There's another interesting aspect of this that, that I think is important to point out, is that these mosquitoes don't travel very far from where they were born. The majority of them only go up to maybe a couple hundred yards away from where they were born. The, this mosquito lives for somewhere in you know, the, the two to three week span, and, uh, and from what the evidence that I could find in, in the literature was, is that most of them travel less than 500 yards in total their whole life. Uh, so they like to stay right near where they're born, and again, that's, that's because they stick in the urban environment. This is, this is my house, I'm willing to admit it. I think that, okay. unfortunately, we've, we've all talked about how my house has had these mosquitoes there in the past. So, but I want to point out to you that if you're taking care of your yard, if you're dumping out the standing water and removing breeding grounds in your yard, you are actually helping everyone around here. And same, same, and same. So when we found the mosquitoes in, in my yard with the help of, of Kelly's folks from Mosquito Control, 
uh, and here I am, the person who's very well adept at knowing how to get rid of these environments. We still had them. Turned out that one of our neighbors had uh, larvae in a bird bath that was back in the backyard that no one even thought about that was about a door and a half down from mine. So we were able now to know that we need to go and, and rinse this out. This was an elderly person that we tried to help out. So, so now we go and rinse it out. But it's important to recognize almost like a, like a crime watch or a neighborhood watch that, that you're helping your neighbors if you're taking care of your own property with this. And also to know that if you have these mosquitoes on your property, they are being bred nearby. They're not coming from, you know, again, I've got lakes over here and here. That's not where they're coming from. They're coming from nearby. So we can engage, I think, with our neighbors and our, and our close friends in our community and really help. This is a distribution. It's an old slide, but I just want to point out again, where we find these mosquitoes is where we find people. They're not out in the marshes. They're not out in the lakes. They are urban mosquitoes. They like to be near us. So it's very important to keep that in mind when we're trying to dump the breeding grounds out. So how do we combat this threat of mosquito-borne illness? We, uh, we do throw through Orange County Mosquito Control, and uh, Mosquito Control is overseen by Kelly Deutsch, the hopefully soon to no longer be acting manager of Mosquito Control, hint, hint. So yes. <laughs> that's my goal, coming to you at a meeting <laughs> At soon. a meeting shortly. <laughs> Uh, so, so Kelly's got 30 positions. We were, we, we were pre-active, or, or I guess proactive, you'd say, uh, this year in thinking that we might have a busy summer, and indeed we have. And we were able to get 10 additional seasonal spots, and we've been utilizing those to, to some good effect. Uh, our total budget hasn't changed. We've talked about this. We've been feel very supported by, uh, by, the, by the mayor and the board here. And as of right now, we haven't needed or requested additional funds from you. But it's important to recognize that that, that could change over time. And that's part of the reason why we want to make sure everyone recognizes what we've been doing. Uh, so we have an 18-vehicle fleet that goes all around the county, countywide, doing abatement and surveillance programs. So we do this either on scheduled or unscheduled site visits. And what we do is we trap and identify both adults and larvae of different mosquitoes and look for the types that we know can spread diseases. We're focusing on Aedes aegypti and albopictus for this conversation. One of the big things we do is destroy breeding habitats, which we'll talk about, and we also use controlling uh, substances that, that will help us with, with ridding ourselves of those mosquitoes if it's possible to do so. We also collaborate very closely with the Department of Health, and this helps us in a sense of specific diseases targeting specific sites. It's also how we do testing of our mosquitoes. We have the ability, to, when we catch these mosquitoes, to send them to a lab down in Kissimmee, and they'll test and see if any of those mosquitoes are infected with Zika. And again, this is new from the last time we talked to you guys. We didn't have that capability, and now we do. So our control techniques, specifically for Aedes, uh, there, there are certain types of traps. Some are more sophisticated than others. I think the, the ones we really think about here are the, the BG traps. These are traps that actually have, a, you could say, lure in these mosquitoes with a human scent and with carbon dioxide, so they, they bring the mosquitoes to them uh, from a certain area. When we set those traps and we find this specific type of mosquito, we know we have to go out looking for the breeding grounds, and if, if we think it's amenable to doing some spraying and adulticide and larvicide. Mainly what we do is remove standing water as much as we can, right? And we also encourage everyone to use barrier protection. That means repellents that have DEET. That means long clothing. That means utilizing your screens and your air conditioning. We talk about this a lot, and we're going to go into a little more detail about it. But this requires manpower, and it requires public engagement, because there's only so much we can do, and there's only so many properties we can go on. And every seven days, you need to pay attention to dump it out again, which is very difficult to, to encourage people to do. <clears throat> We also have controlling substances, like I mentioned, larvicides, adulticides. These are targeted towards specific types of mosquitoes. It's important. We say it over and over again. You can't spray your way out of this. Uh, timing is very important for use of these sprays. You can't use it midday. The sun uh, you know, basically destroys it. And you, know, you, you can't just fly over and spray a whole community and think it's going to work. Uh, we have seen some suggested, uh, you know, I guess, usage of aerial spraying in that area in, in Wynwood. There's been people talking about it. I think it's important for you to know that, that Kelly and I, and, and I know a number of other of her uh, colleagues in mosquito control have talked about it. it. It doesn't make a ton of sense for us at this point. You have to realize you'd be spraying from several hundred to several thousand feet up, hoping that one or two droplets of your stuff falls into some small container near a house, and otherwise just wasting it, spraying it everywhere else. Currently, we still think the right thing to do is specifically target areas and have our boots on the ground and use the, the, the smaller sprayers that we have in our vehicles and with our people to go just to where the sites are. Uh, obviously, if evidence were to change and to suggest that aerial spraying would be more effective for these mosquitoes, we do have contracts in place and we'd be able to do so very quickly and we're able to work on that you know, very, very fast to make it happen. So what would happen, what does happen, I guess, when uh, we have a suspected case of Zika in our community? How does it, how does it work? 
the first thing you have to do uh, as a medical community is suspect the illness at all. So a physician has to suspect the illness and then send the test off. So the presence of Zika we mentioned can be determined in blood or, or uh, urine samples. Uh, the Department of Health requires mandatory reporting for these tests. So as me as a physician, if I sent off a, a Zika blood test, the minute it gets sent off, it gets flagged and our Department of Health is notified that this individual had a test run and that becomes a suspect case for us, right? The Department of Health does a couple of things. They send people out to talk to that suspect case and find out, have you traveled anywhere? Where have you gone? Where do you live? What do you do? Because they're looking to make sure this is a travel associated case or if it's someone who hasn't left the country in two years, obviously a lot of flags come up. How, why are we even suspicious, right? They also notify Orange County Mosquito Control and we start working immediately to try to figure out what we can do to mitigate the threat of any mosquitoes biting that individual. So again, before it's even confirmed and when there's suspect cases, this is what happens. For every suspect case, we give given map coordinates by the Department of Health. We maintain privacy of that individual. We don't find out the exact address, but we get basically the general area. Our crews go there and perform surveillance within 220 yards of the property. Remember I mentioned about 150 yards they fly, so we go out further than where we think these mosquitoes will go. And then we go to every property within that 220 yard circle and we start looking for and removing breeding habitats. We set traps in that area. If we think it's necessary, we find reason to, we'll spray adult side locally in those areas. And we leave door hangers, and there's some, some evidence of the door hangers there behind on everyone. So we say mosquito control was here. Make sure you dump your standing water. This is our concern. We don't say your neighbor has Zika, but it says he, here we are, we've been here, right? And we do this whenever we go anywhere, regardless of whether it's Zika or something else. We then return in 24 hours and check the traps. If the traps have Aedes mosquitoes, we repeat. If they don't, then we say, okay, we, we can move on. We've done the right thing. So if you look, it's, it's sort of a cycle, right? We perform surveillance, we remove habitats, we spray, we set traps, and either the traps are empty of, the, of Aedes and we feel good about it, or they're not. We find Aedes. If that happens, we send those mosquitoes to a lab mosquito in uh, Kissimmee to see if they have the Zika virus, and then we repeat the cycle. We perform more surveillance and keep looking until we know they're gone. This happens for every suspected case. It doesn't have to be a positive case, just someone who had the blood work sent off and a suspect. As you can imagine, that's a lot of work and a lot of man hours. So we've had 409 suspect cases in Orange County uh, as of August 15th. I'm stopping on Monday because it changes every day. So as of August 15th, the number of properties we've visited from that is just under 10,000, right? So that's tremendous. So for 400 of them, we visited 10,000 properties. There's only been 52 of those cases that were confirmed to have Zika, but it doesn't change the fact that we've been to all those properties around the suspect cases. Thankfully, and I want to emphasize, we have had no local transmission cases here in Orange County. We've tested just under 100 vials of, of Aedes mosquitoes, about 1,500 in total. None of them have been positive for Zika. So as of right now, we've had no local transmission and we have no evidence that the mosquito population here is carrying the virus in any way. So that's all good news. But I think it's important to recognize that. We've also heard about the money that's coming from the feds through the state to us. Hopefully more of it will come down. As of to date, we have received a total of about 125,000, a little, little less than that, uh, dollars uh, of that money. We have been able to utilize it. But again, you can see in, in an area with, with good resources like us, we're able to make do because you guys have allocated enough for us to have a really robust mosquito control population. But you can see how this could be a problem for places that don't have those kind of resources. So that's a concern we have region-wide. <clears throat> There's other things we've done over the last several months. We've been very proactive about communication. I uh, just talked to our colleagues in, in uh, Orange County Communications and told we're right under or right around 100 different media reports since February about this, and that's how Kelly's become a, a TV star. Uh, <laughs> we also have on the Orange County website links to education and PSAs regarding Zika, including a very awkward video of myself in it's my yard. It's a great video. <laughs> and although I'm too old to really understand it, I've been told our social media outreach has been consistent. <laughs> I, I think it's really important to recognize here our communication staff, in particular, Carrie Proudfit, Doreen Overstreet, and Emery Varga have been instrumental in this. They've become experts in mosquitoes. They have done everything from go on the road and, and you know, meet all our folks to, to help arrange press conferences for, for you know, folks from the, the federal government who have come down and visited, like the Surgeon General. So I think it's really important to recognize that this piece of it's very important. We've also been engaging with our community. So starting literally in the winter, it seems like we've been doing it forever now, uh, we've been providing education to groups like the Central Florida Hotel and Lodging Association. Kelly's been meeting with regional lawn care businesses and discussing with them. We have talked to this about this at our emergency medical services advisory council meetings. We meet with the airport. 
We've discussed it with the school system. So we've been meeting and engaging with everyone. We've also begun engaging more with our staff. We had a meeting to collaborate with HR, the department directors, and I believe at the next quarterly managers meeting we'll be discussing what we should do and can do with our staff. And I, and I agree, that's important. We are a large employer. And I think we're encouraging other large employers to take that advantage to say, look, you're, most of your staff not just works here but lives here. So let's get them engaged, and I think that's a good way to do it. So what would happen if we were to have local transmission, right? If there was local transmission in Orange County, the response would have basically three different sections. There would be a section that was devoted to the public health aspect of this, a section that was more operations based, and then there'd be the outreach and communications piece. The public health piece is owned by the Department of Health here, almost certainly with local transmission based on what happened in Miami, I would assume they would engage with the CDC as well, and they would start working together down that decision tree of where people went, who might be affected by this, who do we need to test, right? They have people that can do that, they have the resources to do it, and they actually have the legal right to go and, and basically get blood and urine samples from people that, that no one else has. The operation side is largely mosquito control. Our plan would be that we would uh, open up the EOC at a, at a low level so that we could have our emergency managers involved in our decisions. And mosquito control would start working with them to look and see how we needed to increase our resources if we needed to to focus on a specific area very intensely like they're doing in Miami. From the outreach section, Orange County Communications and the mayor's office would, would likely take the lead along with the state, as we saw before, probably the Surgeon General and anyone from Tallahassee, as they tried to describe you know, what we need to do. And I think that communication piece is probably the most important, to be honest, because I feel pretty confident in, in our ability to do the public health and operations pieces. And, and I think that it's really important to focus on how we message to everyone in the community. And the mayor has said it, and I agree with her, that. If this were to happen, I think we'd get a, a renewed engagement of everyone saying, oh, geez, it's, it's here now. Now we have to do it. So, uh, we'd like to think that people are paying attention before, but, uh, but I think it's important to mention that that is likely what would happen. So we would increase our surveillance as we needed to, door to door and traps if we needed to. We have a plan to utilize our citizen emergency response teams. We're also reaching out to HOA volunteers. We'd have the ability to also utilize our medical reserve corps for manpower if we needed to, to get more manpower on the on boots on the ground. The Department of Health would be responsible for zero prevalence, which means what they're doing right now in Miami-Dade, where they're testing people, even asymptomatic people, and saying, all right, you live with this person who's infected. Let's see if you're infected, and let's see who you might have to. And that's where the tree starts to come down, where you look at the patient zero and everyone else that might have been infected from it. They'd also help us get access to private property if we needed. They have the ability to do that uh, in places we couldn't, and they'd be coordinating very closely with mosquito control here. Communications has already organized press releases, PSAs, media events. They would do everything they can to encourage community action. And I think the mayor has already mentioned we're coordinating messaging right now with our partners in tourism and schools and everyone else here in Orange County. There are some challenges to this if we were to have local transmission here, and I think that it's important. Number one for the mosquito control side is addressing the emergent area while maintaining our normal operations. We have other things we need to do, other diseases we need to make sure that we're surveying and abating for. Kelly had mentioned to me that one of her colleagues in Palm Bay had thousands of requests the day after they had their first Zika case, and that does not surprise me. People are gonna call in. We're used to responding very quickly when, our, when folks from our community call us, and it could be very difficult. So we need to maintain how we would keep our regular operations running. We obviously want to work together with our partners to minimize any economic impact and empower our businesses to join this mitigation effort as soon as possible. A lot of them have already been doing it for a long time very well. We want to ensure our message is reaching all Orange County residents. I was just told as of today or yesterday, we officially now have our door hangers in English, Spanish, Creole, and Portuguese. So we should be able, again, and we'd be able to target individual neighborhoods if, if we're told or if we know there's neighborhoods where distinctly, particularly the Creole and Spanish would work better for those, for those people. Uh, and we need to collaborate with the intentral, entire Central Florida region. Uh, Mayor, again, mentioned we're going to be meeting with folks from the surrounding counties, and I think that's really important because a, a local transmission case in Seminole or Osceola affects us unfortunately just as much as a local case in Orange does, in my opinion. So we need to know about those things and share information and make sure we're all doing best practices. I wanna end on a couple slides that hopefully show, you know, some, some levels of confidence, okay? And maybe some reason for optimism as, as hard as it may mm -hmm. seem. You know, there is still a very low likelihood of a major outbreak in, in the United States and here in Central Florida. We fortunately do not have, you know, neighborhoods like this, like the, the slums in Rio that we have seen really massive transmission. We are more likely to, to see neighborhoods in Orange County like this where people do have screens and air conditioning. We do have access to insect repellent. I've mentioned we have a robust mosquito control operation here. We synchronize very well with public health. 
Our, our constituents have good access to OBGYN care. There's a lot of reasons to believe that a coordinated effort and the way that we live and where we are will make it easier for us to isolate outbreaks into small areas like we've seen happen in Miami-Dade where you have this one square mile where it's not spreading like wildfire everywhere. And that's very important to keep in mind. This threat is real and, and it's, it is unfortunately knocking on our door, but there's no reason to suspect that what we, would, what, what we see in some of these other countries is the way we would see it occur here in the United States. And I give as an example to that dengue and chikungunya, which both exist rampantly in those places, may exist here, are spread by the same mosquitoes, and yet we do not see huge outbreaks of this. We see local hotspots that we usually address with a lot of manpower, and it works. So I have, I believe, I think we have reason to have some confidence in that. And the other is where are we going with this? Again, there's a lot of, uh, of research now occurring, and I showed you this slide a few months ago. And, uh, and there's been an, an update on this. And when, what is the future of mosquito control? You know, there are concerns over time that mosquitoes, particularly Aedes, could become resistant to the types of things we use to mitigate them. Uh, but there's a lot of things on the horizon of other ways to control them. And one of them, which is being considered in the state of Florida, in the Florida Keys, are these uh, genetically modified Aedes mosquitoes, where essentially the males have been modified to pass on a gene that would not allow their, their offspring to live. They would never become, uh, the larvae would die. And if these males are released and they breed with the females, so that over time you would decrease the likelihood of having this population of mosquitoes. These have been used safely in other places, and the FDA actually did approve their use in an area of the Florida Keys, and that the Florida Keys is now, I believe, coming to vote this fall to decide if they want to try this. Uh, again, a lot of eyes are on it. There's always concerns when you talk about anything genetically modified. Scientifically, it's very elegant. I'm, I'm impressed by these things. Um, but, but I do think that it'll be interesting to see how, how the citizens of the Keys react mm -hmm. to the idea of perhaps doing this, uh, because it has been used in the past with some success. So I think this and some other future modalities actually really, really can be considered at some point in our life. But for right now, we're still at the basics. And what we really need people to do is to dump out standing water, engage with us in the fact that they should be covering up, wearing long sleeves when possible, using repellent. Repellent is safe. DEET is safe. If you're pregnant, you can still use it. Use your screens, use your air conditioning, do everything you can to avoid those mosquito bites and destroy those breeding habitats, help your neighbors, help the community, and that's the effort that we're trying to get out there. And with that, I'll take any questions. Excellent job, excellent job. Um, the one other uh, thing that I would add to that in terms of a reason to be encouraged, I think the, the visual um, was helpful for us to understand how different um, Central Florida is and Orange County is. But I, I think there's the, the component of our ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, the great effort that's already underway, um, an engaged media and an electorate, a, well, beyond electorate, a public that we have seen um, that rises to the occasion when they need to. And so I'm also very heartened that if, when we need the public to really focus on this, they will. The, the important thing, though, is if we could get them to focus on it now, we reduce the possibility of that first local case. Because the more that we limit the population of these two mosquitoes, the less likely that anybody who comes here from another place that returns from Brazil or Puerto Rico that might have the infection, they can have the infection. If the mosquito doesn't bite them, the infection doesn't go anywhere, um, absent. Um, sex, obviously. So that's um, another reason that if we can be proactive on this, we can really um, reduce the likelihood of um, a, a locally transmitted case. So wanted to bring this to the board to field any questions to kind of test this out to see is there anything that we're missing from your perspective before we take this um, and Dr. Hunter and um, and our manager, acting manager, on the road. I will say that um, I shouldn't get ahead of myself, but Ms. Deutsch has been with us um, and is extremely qualified and um, will be sending out a memo shortly. But uh, our ME did such a phenomenal job, and he had also been in-house with us. And um, I don't think we could be more pleased with him. And I'm always proud when we are able to promote from within because it tells me, and Ajit, this is a compliment to you, it tells me that we're doing a good job because in a, in a perfect world, people that are um, working here in Orange County have the opportunity to rise up and achieve all their goals without leaving us. So really uh, excited about the opportunity to bring Ms. Deutsch's recommendation forward. Commissioner Clark. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I hope, hope we see that soon because I know she tutored under Dr. Bro, who was exactly. probably one of, if not the best mosquito control director I've ever had the pleasure of being around. Mm -hmm. 
A um, couple, you know, from Jim Becker's presentation, I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, we're going to collect electronics and this and that. Maybe we should have a collect the collector's day um, where people could actually, you know, they, 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 you empty them and you just chuck them back in your yard. And maybe if you could throw them out front and somebody could come out and pick them up, they wouldn't stick around to continue breeding them. Because it is, I mean, it's something we struggle with, you know, mm -hmm. from time, from day one as far as mosquitoes go. And bromeliads, I mean, we need to let the folks Thank know. Maybe co-op could get some words out about bromeliads because they are just basically mosquito breeders when it rains. And uh, they're a little harder to dump out, but uh, you can go yeah. shake them. But my other question now, when, when they did the, the 9,000 visits, is the health department doing the epi on that? No, no. so what, what happens for us, again, we'll come to a site. They'll give us, they're doing the epi on the individual that had the okay. suspect case. Okay. If it comes positive, then, then they do a, a little more detail about what's going on with that mm -hmm. individual. At first, what they try to do is ensure that this is someone who had recently left the country, been somewhere yeah. where there's, you know, have a real strong reason to believe this could be Zika. Mm -hmm. Again, the, the symptoms are so, A, mild, and B, nondescript. You could have a cold or, a, you know, basically be fighting almost any little viral thing. And uh, the, the real issue there, again, comes to travel history to them and then the suspect case. So we go to the, the neighborhood and we go to the properties in that area, in, in that kind of circular area around uh, and at that point it's it's just us uh, mm. if and when we've had cases that were positive for Zika uh, we have had the ability to come back with the Department of Health if we weren't able to get on properties and had concerns okay, we are good. able to work with them on that and we have yeah. done that in the past when we had issues um, you know I, I, again that's always a problem for us uh, you know we can get two properties we have some ability to get to get on properties and there probably is some and we're, we're working together uh, with both the Department of Health and County Legal to determine when we are able to get on properties without being invited, particularly less not being invited, but people just not being home. Right. Um, you know, so th those issues still are there and we're working with them. And again, it's public engagement for us to recognize when we come, when we're knocking, let us on, let us help you out. Uh, and that, that's, you know, part of the plea, I guess, for the public is to let us help you when we get there. Yeah, that's good. And code enforcement helping you out when they see things we, out we, the field? I think we have the ability to do that. And good. that's something that we're, that we're looking at right now when we've had to get on property and we couldn't and we needed to, we've used the Department of Health. Yeah. Um, but we're looking at the options for working with code enforcement as well. But that's we great. also, we also um, need to have code enforcement um, thinking through a different lens about mm -hmm. what they're looking for right. because yeah. they're out they're looking at properties a lot of the properties that they are identifying um, as code problems are also going to have standing water mm -hmm. problems Absolutely. I mean I, I think of those junkyard environments yeah. that I think each one of us have seen over time in our districts and those are huge potential problems yeah. so we need them to be um, equally in, informed yeah. and engaged. And I think I might have misunderstood. I think I, I thought I heard you say when we've had positive cases. Travel related cases, Mary. Thank we've had 52 <laughs> travel related cases. So whenever we've it comes had back no positive. mosquitoes that have tested positive. No, absolutely positive. not. Okay. I'm talking about human beings yeah. who had Thank been tested you. and were positive, okay. all of which had been determined to have traveled okay. to places where they would have been infected. I think I zoned out for one second. Sorry. I want to make sure if anybody else misunderstood <laughs> what I might have misunderstood <clears throat> that we got, um, we are all on the same page. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Very informative. I think, uh, you know, the more we can educate the public, you know, the better. And this does an excellent job about that. that. The one question I had, you may have covered it, but I missed it. And that is of, um, of, uh, of, of women that, that are pregnant that become infected. Mm -hmm. What is the percentage of those that have children with birth defects? Sure. It's an excellent question, and it's one that no one has a very, very good answer to yet because that link was made so recently. Sci scientifically, a year has gone by, which is like a, a second when it comes to research and figuring things okay. out. Um, because it's difficult right now to determine exactly that, and there's a lot of people going back looking for it. It's not as though if you are pregnant and you were infected, 100% something's going to happen. I think that's perception. Uh, uh, I think that's cer perception. Certainly not the case. Obviously, it also has a lot to do with how late you are in pregnancy. There is some, some research coming out now suggesting people a little later in pregnancy than we thought could still have some effects. But when it comes to microcephaly, the brain is developing very early on in, in pregnancy. It develops throughout. But when it comes to the, the majority of those neurons moving to that area and the skull being formed and all of that. So it's much more dangerous early in pregnancy. I think that everyone would agree on that. Um, it's not like a 100% thing. No one knows exactly the percentage yet. I think what, what's important to note, what we know now, you know, the, um, the, the governor has, has decreed essentially that the Department of Health will offer Zika testing to every pregnant woman for free, which is a huge step uh, to, to be able to say that. I think most uh, obstetricians 
would say to, to use some, um, you know, maybe a, a little bit more clinical suspicion with that, people who aren't traveling, people who aren't sick, that perhaps, you know, you should just go through your normal prenatal care. But prenatal care in and of itself is just so important to get. Uh, and not a lot of people get it. Uh, you know, well, I guess a lot of people get it. There's still a number of people that don't get it the way they should. Yeah. So I think that those things would be great to be able to publicize and for I don't necessarily know the answer, and I don't want to give the wrong number. I don't want to say 20 percent because I don't want to be wrong. Um, so we're still working to figure that out. Again, we, the royal we, scientific community. Uh, mm -hmm. But I can try to get you, if you'd like, some more of the research on it. But I, I don't stick it in this talk because I want to be clear on the fact that there's still a lot we don't know. I think the one thing we do know is that there is an increased chance of really significant birth defects if you get infected while you're pregnant and that we should all be very careful about it, particularly if you're a childbearing age or if you're planning to get pregnant or you are pregnant. Those are people that need to be very cautious right now, particularly with travel to areas where we know that this is endemic. That's not here. We don't have an endemic spread, but it should be, you know, if you're planning a trip to parts of South America, Central America, and the Caribbean where you know it's endemic and you're trying to get pregnant, I think it would be reasonable to take some precautions and at the very least think about the, your trip and also at least think about how you're going to protect yourself when you're there. And for our community's sake, think about how you're protect, going to protect yourself when you come back. Uh, and that goes for the men, too, in this community who are traveling and coming back. Uh, if they, you know, again, if, if they are married to people of childbearing age and thinking about kids, you really do have to consider that. So. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you. All right, thank you. So um, a question that, that I've had, and now you, now you just made me think it is more important. So if a man um, is carrying Zika mm -hmm. and he transmits it sexually, I'm assuming that the woman is contagious back to the mosquito population. Yes. Okay. So this is a greater actual threat than just whether the woman is thinking about getting pregnant. It's another way of transmitting. Uh, absolutely, yeah. and that's where the CDC, yeah. their, what their criteria is right now, is if you've traveled to an area that's endemic, you should be cautious for three weeks afterwards because it's a little over the two weeks they think it's in your blood. But mm -hmm. for men in particular, if they've traveled, they recommend safe sexual practice for at least 90 days and really up to almost six months. And they, they recommend not attempting you know, to procreate at that period yeah. until you're well outside that window because unfortunately the virus does last longer mm -hmm. that way, uh, so, so yeah. you have more likely to spread it weeks and months later. Yeah. yeah, and I've heard a number of people, and then I'm going to call on you, Commissioner, but I've heard a number of people say this is really a much smaller problem than they thought because it only affects, you know, in a serious way, um, women in, uh, that are pregnant or becoming pregnant. I would urge everybody in our community not to think about it that way yeah. um, because it, we all have a social responsibility. Um, and I have actually heard that said a few times, and I just think that that kind of a casual approach towards this is um, dangerous for all of us. The best thing that we can do is be as vigilant as possible and treat this very seriously. Um, if we do that, we'll take the proper prote protections that will safeguard um, all of us here. So um, with that, Commissioner Boyd, you may be the last person to speak. Okay, great. I'll be quick. Um, great presentation. Uh, my uh, question is, is more in regards mm -hmm. to the adult suppression. And I was in um, Immokalee uh, about a month ago and noticed that Collier County was utilizing aerial spraying. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know that that's not something, I guess, that we do here in Orange County. But given the close proximity to these mosquitoes and how far they travel from where they're at, and looking at the map that you had, and it looks like it's mostly urban mm -hmm. uh, and where they're located. And I know the county fox, uh, and they do do that. Um, curious on the uh, the ground game. Sounds like y'all are pretty intense on 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 investigating and looking into those issues. Um, but while we still have the adults that are moving around and being daytime biters, from what mm -hmm. I understand, um, is there anything, or what are we doing in regards to like the adult suppression sure. and, and and working with that kind of ground game that you discussed? Um, I'm just curious about that. Sure, sure. Well, well, part of that ground game is adult deciding as well. Some of the some of the local spraying. When I say local spraying, is adult decide as well. Uh, the, these mosquitoes tend to hide when they're after they're born underneath leaves and things like that. So you'll see them going with the with the handheld sprayers, not just fogging in a neighborhood. Um, so part of it is indeed that. 
you know, again, the, the spraying, when you see aerial spraying across the state, there, there's two reasons for that. One is that there's still a lot of other mosquitoes that are amenable to that, that our, our counties are still utilizing this for. Um, so again, our normal operations still exist. And, I, and again, I want to reiterate, we have the ability to spray aerially um, really very quickly if we needed to. We basically just have to say the word and, and it'll happen. Uh, but as of right now, it, it still isn't the suggested method for this type of mosquito. So we have done spraying in the past for other types that are amenable to it, and we will do it again if we need to. There, the reason why I pointed it out is because I do know, and we know of some areas that have talked about doing it, whether it's for you know, a show of force, whether it's to show, hey, we're doing something, being proactive, or whether there's real good evidence for it is kind of up in the air. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, if you had a situation like you did in Miami-Dade, it wouldn't surprise me that you would say, I'll take any chance I can to just knock this out. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the current situation we have, it, it's not as though the aerial spraying, you know, first of all, there, there's an issue of efficiency of, of how much bang for your buck are you getting. Mm -hmm. There's also the issue of the fact that we like to utilize those chemicals as minimally as possible for reasons, you know, because there, there are individuals who don't want that spray going on sure. their property if they can, and there's other insects that can be affected by them. But I don't want you to think that we're just focusing on the larvae. The, the spray that we do when we're locally on the ground is adulticiding as well, uh, and it does work. And that, that's how we set those traps. The traps are for the, you know, the adults, and, um, and if we're spraying locally and we're not getting trapped adult mosquitoes, we feel confident that we have kind of rid that area of them. Uh, and when it comes to when they're flying around, there's, there's you know, so much you can do. But the real main issue has always just been getting rid of those breeding grounds. Again, they only last a couple weeks. So if you can get rid of the breeding grounds, they will eventually, and then spray and try to get rid of a lot of them, you will eventually get rid of them completely. Um, but, but I'm happy we can meet with you if you want to talk more in depth about, about what we're doing from adult deciding. We okay. can absolutely no, talk that'd be, about that'd be great. Sure. And then I guess on the other thing, Mayor, thank mm -hmm. you for bringing this uh, to mm -hmm. the board. On the communication side, mm -hmm. um, you know, however you uh, package it up with Dr. Hunter and, um, you know, we, I know all of us would love to get it out to our constituents and more help on exactly. that. Exactly. What we're going to do um, with this is tomorrow's um, program is going to be recorded. We're going to put that on our uh, website. Uh, so that everybody will have a link to it, and that is intended to be a great education tool that um, hopefully you know, each of us can communicate out to folks that we know in neighborhoods that would hopefully have kind of a, a mosquito event um, so that they can educate. I really think the more that we make this a neighborhood-focused um, project, the more successful that we're going to be in our residential communities. We'll be working with our apartment, own, apartment owners. We'll be working with <coughs> property managers. We're really trying to look at all of those groups, um, restaurants, everybody that, you know, where people come, every, every individual group that we can think of, we're trying to get the message out to, um, in addition to the, you know, the more global message that's coming. So we will make sure as soon as we've got that together, which should be, I would think, um, and Marie, you're here probably by the first of next week. We'll be able to have what we're doing tomorrow in a form that they can get a hold of. They've got all kinds of um, material. And okay, and you've yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll have handouts. We'll have the videos, and we'll have all that packaged up. Some of it has already gone to your um, aides. The rest of it will be available um, very, very shortly. So hope that you're prepared with the answers you need. If not, you know who to call. And um, if there's anything that you hear of that we haven't covered, let, let either um, uh, Kelly or uh, Dr. Hunter know so that we can include that in future um, uh, presentations that we do. Thank you all so much for what, what you're doing to get the word out. Dr. Hunter, um, Ms. Deutsch, thank you so much. All right, with that, we're going to adjourn until the hour of 2 o'clock. <laughs>